morning, Lord, and evening, Grace America. It's Hugh Hewitt. I'm not there today, but I'm leaving you in the very able hands of Arthur Brooks, president of the American Enterprise Institute, economist extraordinaire, author most recently of The Road to Freedom, and blooming talk show host. Take it away, Arthur. Thanks, Hugh. Arthur Brooks here. I'm sitting in, as you just heard, for Hugh Hewitt, the great Hugh Hewitt, I should add. And this is the Hugh Hewitt Show. We've got a great hour ahead for you right now. Uh, we're going to hear from Ileana Johnson from National Review. He's going to talk about the IRS scandal. Jimmy Pethokoukas, who runs the blog, the economics blog over at the American Enterprise Institute, where I'm also involved. As you know, I'm the president of the organization. Jimmy's going to talk about what's new in the news. He's also going to talk about income inequality. You're going to, you're going to want to hear that. We're also going to take some of your calls. So, as always, be gentle. One of the key themes that we're discussing uh, on the show today is morality. We hear it over and over and over again, morality. And conservatives often are allergic to that word. Why? Because it conjures up memories of the 1990s culture wars of God, guns, gays and abortions. Now, you and I and everybody listening to us have strong opinions on those traditional cultural issues. But there's a tendency to say if you're not talking about those things, you're not going to talk about morality. I'm going to take just a second and see if I can convince you otherwise. I'm going to see if I can convince you that that's a mistake, that we should be talking not less about morality, but more about morality and morality in even in issues of economics and foreign policy. I have this friend. Uh, he's a guy. He teaches at the New York University Stern School of Business. His name is Jonathan Haidt. H-A-I-D-T. Now, if that sounds familiar, it's because he had a huge bestseller last year, New York Times bestseller called The Righteous Mind. John Haidt is the world's leading expert on the science of morality. He's a psychologist. He studies how people uh, determine whether or not what they're doing is moral. He's studied 132,000 Americans approximately over the past 10 years. He's surveyed them on what they find to be moral. And why is that interesting? That's interesting because he came up with some very provocative results that I'd like to share with you. He found that morality indeed is not all relative. There are about there are approximately uh, five pillars of morality that people share. The things that people viscerally believe are moral or immoral behind all of the issues in their lives, behind public policies and cultural constructs and relationships and everything else. So, so what are they? Well, number one is compassion toward the vulnerable. Everybody knows it's immoral to hurt weak people. I mean, maybe if you were raised by wolves, you think it's okay to hurt weak people. But most normal people who are not sociopaths understand that weak people deserve protection. They need help. They don't need to be hurt. And that's a question of basic compassion. Almost everybody, roughly 100% of the population, believes that compassion is, a, is an important moral uh, is an important moral idea. The second is fairness. I know, I know. Obama talks about fairness all the time, and it makes conservatives want to throw up. But you know what? Approximately 100% of Americans demand a fair society, fair play. Nothing makes you angrier, as we're going to find out in our next section, our next session, next session with Eliana Johnson, when the government treats people unfairly, when it targets people just because of their beliefs. It's just not right. It's a question of whether it's constitutional. Of course, I don't know. Uh, some of you have strong opinions on that, but fairness is really what comes into it. So for compassion and fairness, roughly 100 percent moral issues. John Haidt finds there are three other moral constructs as well, but they're only shared by about 30 percent of the population, a, a minority. And they happen to be political conservatives. A lot of folks listening to us on the right will find these familiar. What are they? Number one. Respect for authority. If somebody is in a legitimate position of authority, it's only moral to treat that person with respect. Loyalty to team or country. The basic idea that loyalty is always and everywhere a moral thing. This is a very conservative moral idea, according to the data. And the last is purity, especially in sexual matters. Now, if you're wondering, is this really right? The, the data are overwhelming on this. Authority in particular, it's very interesting. When you ask conservatives about authority, they're vehement. When you ask liberals, they say, I don't know. Is the authority justified? I was talking to a friend of mine, a member of Congress, and I said, you know, I said, just tell me the first thing that jumps into your head when I say flag burning. I was asking him this to illustrate the principle of authority. Flag burning. He immediately says treason. OK, so I call up a very liberal friend and acquaintance of mine and ask him the same question. I say, when I say flag burning, what jumps into your head? And he says, hmm, inadvisable. So there you are. This is the difference between left and right uh, on the question of authority. Loyalty. You know, 
If you're like me, you were outraged back in 2008 because Obama wouldn't wear that flag lapel pin. That's an exact uh, understanding of this particular principle. Loyalty, particularly to country, is something that seems viscerally right to conservatives. It doesn't mean that liberals are unpatriotic. It just means that they treat the whole subject differently. And the last is purity, especially in sexual matters. There's a famous bumper sticker that maybe some of you have seen in San Francisco, the most liberal city in America. It says, maybe your body's a temple, but mine's an amusement park. And and there you are. (laughs) There you are. So in other words, there are 100% moral issues, compassion and fairness. There are 30% moral issues, authority, loyalty, and purity. And then there's some 0% moral issues. These are the things about money. Anytime you talk about money, people can get angry or interested or sympathetic, but they're not going to treat the idea morally. Okay. What does this mean? This means basically in politics this. Conservatives lose when they talk about money, authority, patriotism, or sex. Because those range in interest and moral salience somewhere between 0 and 30%. It doesn't mean that they are immoral or we shouldn't have moral feelings about this. It just means that we're not connecting with Americans. When we talk about compassion and fairness, however, these are 100% moral issues. And that's, of course, the traditional... Uh, bailiwick of the left. They win because they talk about compassion and fairness. They win because we kick compassion and fairness over to them. We say, oh, you guys are the ones who deal with poverty. You guys are the ones who care about fairness. You just gave them the two 100% moral issues. And here's the irony. Here's the irony of this. The truth of the matter is, if you want to see who's treated the poor better throughout history, look at the right. Since 1970, the percentage of the world's population living on a dollar a day or less, that is to say starvation level poverty, the percentage of the world's population living on a dollar a day or less since 1970 has declined by 80%. And I bet a lot of you folks listening to that did not know that. An 80% decline. This is, we have experienced in our lifetimes literally the most impressive anti-poverty achievement in the history of mankind. Huh, that's pretty crazy. Why aren't we hearing about this? And the answer is because it's not news when really good things happen, but we better have an explanation. Is it because of the the United Nations or the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank? Those institutions might be good or they might be bad, but let me tell you, that's not the reason. There are five reasons that billions of people have been pulled out of poverty since 1970. Okay, get out your pencils. Globalization, free trade, property rights, rule of law, and entrepreneurship. American style free enterprise to coin a phrase that has not been used by our president. You built that. Everybody listening to us today built that. Americans spread their values around the world. That's an act of global brotherhood. Americans bought stuff, opened up markets, spread entrepreneurship. The ethos of the American spirit has been adopted around the world. That hasn't just been good for money. That has literally set people free to live their lives, to educate their children, not to go to bed hungry. That is a blessed, profoundly moral thing. Unless we can talk about compassion toward the vulnerable, we can point these things out. And unless we can say, this is a moral thing. This is not an economic thing. This is not about the money. This is about treating the least of these in a particular way. We're going to lose and we need to win. The poor around the world and in America need us to win. That's the truth. So here's the question. What are we going to do? Well, to begin with, we have to solve problems that show up in the data. Like when we ask, who cares more about people like you? Conservatives or liberals? You know the answer to that. You know how Americans are answering that question. When they ask the, the, the questions about who had a better set of policy ideas and who was a better leader, in 2012, Romney beat Obama hands down in most polls. But when asked who cares more about people like you, Obama won those polls 80-20. People will not vote for politicians or a political party. They will not support people who don't care about people like them. And the only way people are going to believe that the right cares about people like them is for them to talk openly and constantly about what's written on our hearts, which is to say compassion toward those who are vulnerable and real fairness. It also means having a policy agenda that matters, a policy agenda that starts with why. The why, as you know, I believe very strongly, uh, fighting for people. It means having policies that that uh, revolve around compassion and fairness. Policies like education reform that lift people up, entrepreneurship for the poor, 
have, being able to say something like, if you're poor and you want to start a landscaping business, morally, the only thing that you should have to own is a lawnmower. You shouldn't have to know a lawyer. You shouldn't have to have an accountant. These are not economic ideas. These are moral ideas. And the last is having a long-term commitment to fight for all Americans every year, whether they vote for us or not. It's my two cents. Looking forward to hearing what you think. Next up, Ileana Johnson is going to talk to us about fairness. Fairness in that story that just won't go away. IRS targeting of Tea Party groups and conservatives. This is Arthur Brooks, guest hosting for Hugh Hewitt, and this is The Hugh Hewitt Show. Stay tuned.